was almost exactly two years ago, a couple weeks uh, more than that, that we, we became owners of Politics and Prose. And it was also about two years ago, almost exactly, that Marvin and his wonderful daughter, Deborah, who's in the back, uh, were here to talk about their great book, Haunting Legacy. And um, it turned out, I was thinking about this today, to be the first author event that I ever introduced at Politics and Prose. So I hadn't even really remembered that until I was thinking back on it. And uh, what a great one to start with, and what a delight and honor to be introducing Marvin Kalb again today. Uh, you probably all know he's a great friend of this store and of bookstores in general. He's one of our nation's most respected journalists over uh, several decades, and uh, obviously a prolific author who continues to enrich our understanding of the world in which we live in, especially, uh, especially with this book and the one before it, The Roots and Patterns of Pre Presidential Decision-Making, particularly in relation to conflicts and wars. Uh, his new book, The Road to War, looks at dipl diplomatic commitments made by presidents, how and why presidents are less likely today to rely on declarations of war, congressional approval, before engaging our country militarily, and even before promising to back up treaties and agreements with their own public or private commitments of American military support. Is this because of the changing nature of conflict, different kinds of enemies, a need for quicker and more nimble responses around the world that we're now in this situation? And is Congress acquiescent, resigned, or just incapable of demanding more involvement for themselves? These are but a few of the, the many questions answered in this book. Marvin lays out the evolution of presidential commitments and suggests prescriptions for better ways of safeguarding our security and that of our allies. And I think we can all uh, individually think back over the last 30 years or just look and scan a map of the Middle East or the Korean Peninsula or parts of Central and South Asia to appreciate how important this very issue is. So this is another uh, terrifically important book and, and also a wonderful book. I have to say you're really producing them at quite a pace, uh, for which we're grateful. I hope all of you will read it when it comes in. And I also have to say that I hope every American president, uh, past and future, will read it as well. Please join me in welcoming Marvin Kalb to Politics. Um, I was telling Lisa earlier that I have traveled around the country and spoken at many bookstores. And I really feel that this is probably the best of them all. You keep up a terrific opportunity. It's wonderful for authors. It kind of is a stamp of legitimacy. I mean, if you speak of politics and prose, meh, you know, the book is, must, be, must be worth reading. You know, um, in the heat, my mind doesn't work all that well. And so the lead, which journalists are always looking for leads, my lead may not be exactly right, but what I've been thinking about is that in the last couple of weeks, the, those, those of us who still read newspapers have come upon stories about the NSA, and we ask ourselves, what's going on here? And the president himself raised a question in a speech two or three weeks ago in which he said he thought that the nation ought to really sit down at this point and have a conversation with itself about the balance between personal liberty and security. And is there a relationship between the two? And I think that what we're finding with all of these NSA revelations is that there is a very direct relationship between one and the other. And that relationship is that as you begin to examine what it is that the NSA has been doing over the last several weeks, you come upon one example after another of increasing centralized governmental authority. Um, and we're not really all that worked up about it. Because I think most Americans, judging by polls, just my own gut feeling, is that most Americans have come to their own personal decision that they'd rather have security than they would all of the personal freedoms that are guaranteed and that they feel are so important to them as American citizens. Now, if that is the case, we are all living in a rather passive democracy. It is a democracy. The president himself is absorbed with this problem. We are all aware of it because of what happens day to day. Uh, it hits us every morning when you pick up the paper about another revelation. And all of these revelations add up to accumulated governmental power in pursuit of greater security, it is argued, for all Americans. And for me, 
that large point is where the road to war fits. Because what I've tried to do in this book is address one central issue, and that is the role of the president in making war, in leading the nation into war, in deciding at a certain point to stop the war and to begin to pull out. And what we have found time and time again is that there is an increasing vesting of power in the presidency when it comes to the making of war. And that what we had up to World War II as a pattern of operation no longer exists. That pattern of operation was consistent with what it is stated in the Constitution of the US, and that is that Congress shall declare war. That that is not a presidential responsibility, it is a congressional responsibility. And the last time Congress declared war was in December 1941, after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. So you have to ask yourself, what has happened then over the last 70 years or so? And what has happened is, to begin, right after World War II, we live in a nuclear age now. We can't all be smart enough to know when to use or not to use this weapon or that weapon, leading up possibly to the use during the Cuban Missile Crisis of nuclear weapons. So who is going to do that? Well, clearly, the president is the one we, we voted for. He's the one with national authority. He's the one we should back up. And in a way, that makes perfect sense. Except we have always lived in a system of checks and balances. And if all power is vested in one of the three branches, the other two are out of whack. And this country has functioned in a magnificent way because of a hidden magic among the three branches of government. But when too much power is in one branch, the other two tend to melt away. I'm not talking about the judicial. I am talking about the congressional. If Congress has the right, the responsibility to declare war, where has it been in the last 70 years when we have gone from one war after another? Where has it been? I remember, because I covered these things, and, um, and Brad might have covered these as well, but in the 1960s, Senator Fulbright, in February of 1966, disagreeing profoundly with the direction of the Vietnam War, decided to hold a set of hearings. And those hearings were under the auspices of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. They were superb hearings in a number of ways. He invited everybody who knew about Vietnam, knew about China, to come in and talk to us. Us meaning not just the senators sitting there, but us meaning the American people. And the Secretary of State came, Secretary of Defense, Treasury, then all of the scholars came, then all of the journalists came. And at the end of the day, it's interesting that in the first month after the hearings took place, American support for the war in, um, in Vietnam dropped from 63 to 49%. So the hearings were having a profound and important effect. Most important to me at the time and to a number of us reporters covering this was that we were being educated and through us, the American people were being educated to major events taking place in their name involving their blood and treasure with an explanation delivered by the top people in the US government. None of that is happening today. And none of that has been happening. So one president after another has been able to accumulate all of this power of war making. It is not a question of any president deciding that he is going to seize power. It is simply that gradually, as Congress pulled back, receded from responsibility, the president simply acquired that extra power in a totally different way. Um, Lenin, during the Russian Revolution, was asked at that point, how do you take power? And he said, it was in the street, and I picked it up. 
And one president after another has simply acquired and is using that power because no one else was. And so at this particular point, we are in a situation where a number of things flow from that large fact. And by the way, it is not a, sing a, a line, a straight line up in the accumulation of power. It's up and down, but still going that way. And the up and down happens occasionally, and I ought to point this out, that during um, George Herbert Walker Bush time in office, when we went into Kuwait with 500,000 men, Bush did encourage a debate in the Congress. There was that debate. He won by six votes, but he won as a result of a debate. It actually happened. Most of the time, that does not happen. And what you get from the Congress is a pat on the back. It's, it's Mr. President, you're a really wonderful guy, and we love you, so we're with you. But that's not the same thing as authorizing the use of force. So what happens? What happens is that given the nature of the media today, given the nature of the way in which we acquire information, any statement by the president regarding a major foreign policy issue becomes automatically the policy of the United States of America. The subtitle of this book is Presidential Commitments Honored and Betrayed. So what happens is the president says, for example, um, Obama, uh, during the presidential debates last year, several times even before that, the United States, he says, will not allow Iran to develop nuclear weapons. That statement, on its own, the statement becomes a commitment on the part of the US government. It is a commitment. No one is standing up at that point and saying, Mr. President, who gave you the right to say that? Or, wait a minute, we have another point of view. No. He said it, and that becomes policy. It's never been that way before. And presidential commitments today get this country into all kinds of uh, difficulties. <clears throat> Do you mind if I take my jacket? Um, you get into all kinds of difficulties. And what I try to do in the book is deal with ways in which presidential commitments are honored, how we get into those commitments, and in the case of Israel, commitments that are based on private presidential letters to an Israeli prime minister, and those letters become the policy of the United States, quite often unchecked even by other members of the cabinet. Again, the power of the president to make policy unchecked by congressional constraint. I deal with Korea, South Korea. June 1950, the North Koreans attack South Korea. Harry Truman is president. Harry Truman had said when he took over in 1945 to senior members of the, of the Congress, if I ever have to send American troops abroad, you can count on one thing. I will never do it without your knowledge and your approval. Approval. When the North Koreans attacked, Harry Truman went to the UN Security Council to get his authority to send the US Army into South Korea. The US Congress was not involved in that in any way. The Congress has one other major way it could be involved, and that is it controls the power of the purse. If it really wanted the president to go in another direction, he could, the, the Congress could simply not provide the money for the action, but it doesn't do that. Truman decided at that time to do something that created a legacy, an unhappy legacy, that a president 
can send troops abroad without this kind of congressional check, and no one stops him, no one raises a fundamental question. Because of the absence of criticism of this sort, because of the absence of action by the Congress, one president after another, and by the way, it doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat here, one president after another simply acquires and uses more and more power. Korea ended up in a stalemate, as we know. 53,000 Americans died there, died for a stalemate. This was right after we had won in World War II. World War II was the unconditional surrender of the enemy. We got that. We were feeling superb. We did what we had to do, and there was the backing of the American people behind President Roosevelt and toward the end with, with President Truman. When Truman found himself in the nuclear age with a Cold War developing, with a Joseph Stalin, not really a nice man, seeking to acquire more and more territory in Eastern Europe and then moving toward the West, with the French and Italian Communist parties winning in the 1948 election, 43 and 38 percent of the vote, people in Washington, including the president, were very worried about what is it that is going to happen. And Truman believed that in the midst of this building Cold War with China, huge China, now communist, as of the tail end of 1949, Truman believed that he had to do something to stop the communists. And that was the beginning and the end of the whole story. And he sent the troops there. We ended with the stalemate, which meant that the communists didn't win and we didn't lose. Stalemate. The next major part of this book, which, which for me has an emotional, I mean, it, it, it arouses emotional feelings within me, has to do with the Vietnam War. And I said, or I should have said, that th this book is something that's been sort of boiling up within me now for, for so many decades. Because again, the presidents, one after another, from Truman on up, to Nixon, kept sending American troops to Vietnam, kept saying that this was part of the Cold War, kept saying that the loss of South Vietnam would be injurious to the national security interests of the United States. And so very few people raised a fuss until it began to hit home with the middle class, began to hit home with students, and we had huge demonstrations starting in tail end of 67, most of 68, 69, even into 70, and beyond. The whole country was worked up by the Vietnam War. But there was no declaration. There was no statement from the Congress saying, we authorize you to fight this war on behalf of the interests of the United States. There was, in August of 1964, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which, when you read it, is an, is an absurd document because what it says, in effect, is, Mr. President, um, you can do anything that you want. We're behind you. Anything that you want, anywhere in Southeast Asia. What an absurd way of giving authority to a president when it comes to sending troops abroad. It's an absurd, not serious way of doing business. But Lyndon Johnson wanted something in his hip pocket. And he got it. And so he kept sending people there. And it was toward the end of April of 1975 that the war finally ended, not in a stalemate, but in our ignominious, humiliating defeat. And many of us in this room, because I can see a gray hair or two, will remember the television pictures of April 30, 1975, when Americans were taken from the rooftop of the U.S. Embassy in an adjacent building and taken awaiting helicopters to be taken off to the South China Sea. Humiliating. Where were the American people at this point? Where was the Congress at this point? Nowhere to be heard. 
passive democracy once again. The third part of the book has to do with Israel. And this is, to me, um, an extremely interesting uh, set of questions here. All of us understand that the US-Israeli relationship is extremely close. Probably the United States has no closer relationship with any country anywhere in the world, including Great Britain and including all of our allies in NATO. The kind of closeness that exists is measured by what both sides do on military issues, on intelligence issues. And right now, under this president, the degree of cooperation and coordination on intelligence matters between the US and Israel has never been closer, never. And yet at the same time, the degree of trust between the leaders on both sides has not been very good. I said before that the way presidents set policy today, for the most part, is by either presidential proclamation or by private presidential letters. With the US-Israel relationship, it has been the result of private presidential letters. Whenever there's a problem, the president in question sends a letter to the Israeli prime minister explaining what our policy is going to be. And it doesn't mean that it's always a happy letter. Some of these letters have been quite tough, starting with President Eisenhower. Nevertheless, they are the basis of the relationship. There is nothing else binding the two that is written down that is on a piece of paper. It is simply the word of the incumbent president. To Israel. So, an Israeli asks, well, what happens when that president leaves office? Technically, the word of one president should carry over into the next president, but it does not. And each president can make up his own mind about the way in which he chooses to conduct the U.S. relationship with Israel. And I want to talk about one piece here and the use of the word betrayal. In 1957, right after the 56 war, the US was in the lead in trying to arrange a negotiated end to the 56 war, according to which the Israelis could live with it and the Arabs could live with it. And it was very, very difficult. And the relationship between the US and Israel was rough, very, very rough. Eisenhower, to get out of this, sent a letter to the Israeli Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, in which he said, more or less, in, in, it's written down in the book and you get the exact words, but more or less what he said was, if the Arabs once again close the Straits of Hormuz, clo not Hormuz, close the Aqaba Straits, blocking your passage up to your port of Aqaba, then you have, you and Israel, have a perfect right to reopen that. In other words, to use military force to reopen that. And the United States will support you. Now, there was nothing in the Eisenhower letter that said support you with arms. But the Israelis, wanting to read as much into the letter as they could, assumed that Eisenhower meant with arms as well. And the Israelis put that in their hip pocket, waiting for the next time the Gulf of Aqaba would be closed. And that happened in the spring of 1967, before the 67 war. Egypt, under Nasser, acted again. The Israelis said, you can't do that. We're going to have to go to war. But first, the then Israeli Prime Minister Levi Eshkol said, but first, we have this letter from Eisenhower. And so the United States ought to be doing something. So I'm going to send my foreign minister, Abba Iban, to talk to President Johnson and show him the letter and say, hey, Mr. President, what are you going to do for us? So Iban went. The amazing thing was there wasn't a copy of that letter at the White House. <laughs> Nobody around Johnson 
had any memory of that letter. Something that was acutely important to the Israelis was essentially unknown in the Johnson White House. So Walt Rostow went up to the Eisenhower Library at Gettysburg, and he said, do you have a copy? Fortunately, they did. He brought it back, the president looked at it, and it was clear what the language was. Not a promise of American military support, but full American support was guaranteed. Johnson, by the way, I think Lyndon Johnson were enough for the Vietnam War would have been one of our great presidents. But Johnson looked at Eben and he said, Mr. Foreign Minister, if you do anything on your own, if you preempt, which is what happened, if you preempt, you cannot depend on us. You can depend on us if you follow what it is that I tell you. And what I tell you is, we will go to the UN, and there we will debate this issue. And we will lean on the inherent brilliance of the UN, and they will come in with a solution to this problem. Well, it, that was not serious. And Eben knew it wasn't serious. And Johnson said, you must understand, I am a friend of Israel. I like Israel, I admire Israel. Um, I, I remember once doing a piece from the White House lawn right in the middle of the 67 war and the president came out of a, a doorway there walking a dog. And I called out to him and I said, Mr. President, can you come over here and do a quick interview? And he said, no, no, I don't want to do that. I said, what's your feeling about what the Israelis are doing now? He says, my, I remember this, whole, he said, my, they're a feisty people. <laughs> And he said that with admiration. It wasn't sort of a negative brushing aside. He said it with admiration. He wanted the Israelis to win. They did. We know that. But the question was, Johnson did not live up to what the Israelis thought the Eisenhower letters said. And the word betrayal became part, at the very top levels of the Israeli government, became part of the unfortunate lexicon that one heard. I had the privilege as a reporter of covering this story over many, many years and of having opportunities to talk to three Israeli prime ministers. Um, Golda Meir, Yitzhak Rabin, and Menachem Begin. And though there were differences in politics and differences in points of view, they all ended up saying essentially the same thing, that at the end of the day, the only people we're going to be able to depend upon are the Israelis, are us. We really can't depend on you. You betrayed us once and you'll do it again. I would always argue, believe me, as, as strongly as I could, that that was a, um, I don't know the word that I used, but it was an unacceptable position because look at what the U.S. had been doing for Israel. Look at the amount of military supplies, the amount of money, the UN support, the diplomatic backing, political backing. Uh, look what goes on in Congress. How can you say that? Oh, we appreciate all of that, they would say. But at the end of the day, when things are rough and you have your own problems, you're not going to be thinking of us. You're going to be thinking of yourselves. And that idea of betrayal is there in addition. It's subterranean, but it's there. And it's, it's in addition to the feelings of not quite distrust, but a lack of trust that the Israeli leadership, not just, not just Netanyahu, but the Israeli leadership has felt toward Obama. After Obama's recent visit, situation has improved a little bit, but basically it remains the same. And you have to understand that there is nothing written down to set rules of the road in the U.S.-Israeli relationship. So if Israel feels it has to attack Iran because of the development of nuclear weapons, it has the word of the United States that the U.S. will be there. But what, how does the word translate into what exactly? And that is the hole in the, in the American argument, and that is the 
not the rift, but it's that area of a lack of trust between the two sides. And it almost doesn't even matter who the prime minister has been because it has gone. It's been a rather consistent thing. And my own feeling about the Israeli-US relationship is that there ought to be rules of the road. There ought to be a treaty governing the relationship, a treaty that is a mutual defense treaty. The US has mutual defense treaties with countries all over the world starting with NATO and Japan and South Korea, Australia, you name it, and we've got a, a treaty. But we don't have one with Israel. And that's a question. Why is that the case? The Israelis will argue up to a point about 10 years ago that according to the Zionist precept, we do our own business. We don't need you. That is not the case now. In 1996, it was... The Israeli Prime Minister, Shimon Peres, who raised this issue with an American president, Bill Clinton, and said, will you give us a mutual defense treaty if we reach a deal with the Syrians on the Golan Heights? And Clinton said, yes. If you have a deal, we'll back it up. We'll back it up with troops, and we'll back it up with a treaty. Four years later, in the year 2000, another Israeli Prime Minister brought it up to President Clinton at Camp David. The argument then was not the Golan Heights, but the Palestinian state. And at that particular time, it was Ehud Barak who raised it with Clinton. Clinton made the exact same point. Yes, I will do it if you reach your agreement with the Palestinians. The United States will be there to back it up. We'll back it up with troops, and we will back it up with a defense treaty. Parenthesis. The Israelis arrived at Camp David in July of 2000 with a draft treaty in their hip pocket. The draft treaty stated that the treaty that they wanted would be similar to the NATO treaty. The NATO treaty, I don't have to tell you, involves, if it were necessary, the use of nuclear weapons. So the Israelis were asking for an American guarantee that would, if necessary, include the use of nuclear weapons. The President of the United States was ready to do that if there was a deal. So in all of this now, and in conclusion, what I want to say is that what I was trying to do in the book was pose this large problem in my mind of the accumulated war-making power of the president unchecked by Congress. And use three illustrations of Korea, Vietnam, and Israel as examples of places where a treaty worked, Korea, Vietnam disaster, Israel excellent relationship, but un but without words. I mean, the words are there, but they are words that can easily be ignored uh, from one presidency to another. So it's always been my sense that there ought to be words that are written down, that both sides can look at, and that would be a mutual defense um, treaty. I hope that that idea, which I know for a fact has begun to be discussed up on the Hill, I know for a fact that the U.S. and the Israelis are thinking about it. I know for a fact that Secretary Kerry, in his recent talks in the Middle East, has begun to talk about ways of solidifying a deal. And one of the ways is treaty, another way is American troops. So how this will all work out, God knows. But uh, it's all terribly important, serious, and I just wanted to share that all with you. So thank you very much. Isn't there also a problem with the cabinet? Namely, why doesn't, uh, I haven't heard the last time a cabinet official resigned on a question of principle uh, of exactly this sort. Uh, it's our response. Uh, 1970. Yeah, but still uh, over the Vietnam War, the escalation and so on. I mean, you do need some kind of a catalyst 
around which uh, the doubts can collect. And uh, I, it seems to me that cabinet officials have not been uh, doing their job. The question has to do with cabinet officials and whether they are or aren't doing their job. I used the expression before, and it's an expression that comes from my brother, not from me, but it's passive democracy. And what Bernie is, is thinking there, and if he's here, he can speak for himself. He's not yet, he'll be here. Um, I think what Bernie has in mind is that there are things that happen to and in this country that normally would arouse anger, anxiety, in the street kind of demonstrating power. And we don't see that. Um, and I have a theory about that, which I'm perfectly happy to share with you. And that is that because we have an all-volunteer military force, that volunteer military force is, represents 0.6% of the American people. 0.6%. That means that 994 have very little to do with the military. It's very interesting. There are studies on who is now joining the military. The sons and daughters of people in the military, not the people from outside. The people on, on the outside believe, in a way, that that whole problem of, that's, that's taken care of by these other people. That has nothing to do with us. It's a very dangerous thing. I think it is an explanation as part of an explanation as to why other parts of the U.S. government, not just the people, but other parts of the U.S. government, reflecting the passivity of the people, do nothing. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Marvin, uh, I heard you at Brookings several weeks ago. Your talk was somewhat from different angles, but of course uh, coalescing with your treatment here. Um, at Brookings, you had briefly touched upon another contribu contributor to the um, increased power of the presidency, i.e., what you called the new media, the new media as opposed to the old media, <coughs> distinguished with people such as yourself for many years. I'm telling you, I wish it were so now. But um, I um, briefly spoke to a member of the new media. NPR major evening anchor, and I asked him about the lead up to the uh, Iraq war. Where was NPR? And his answer was somewhat, I would say, perplexing. He said, there wasn't opposition in the government. You want us to be the opposition. Well, the answer is I would have wanted discussion. At Brookings, you had mentioned that the new media is under the challenge of so much happening with news cycles, ongoing, um, thinking before you, I mean, right. speaking before you think. That's what you mentioned at Brookings. Right. Is the problem perhaps a deeper that maybe the new media is abdicating, similar to what Congress is doing? Well, this, this is, thank you for that, uh, thank that you question. Too. This is a, a very uh, difficult subject for a journalist to talk about, especially one my age, because I bridge both worlds of journalism, the, the Edward R. Murrow era and whatever we're in today. Um, <laughs> journalism, um, for the last 15, 20 years, has been undergoing a revolution. It's a revolution based on two factors. One is financial and one is technological. The financial factor used to be, I knew my boss, he was Bill Paley. He owned CBS and I knew him and he knew me and I won't say we were friends, but we knew each other. Um, I believe that 99% of reporters today haven't a clue as to who their boss is because there are very large corporations that own so much of, of journalism today. Um, and today, everything is based on money and profit. 
if you are not making a profit, you have failed. But of course, that is absurd. You can succeed as a journalist and still not make a profit. But according to the psyche, the, the, the mindset behind today's journalism, you don't make money, you have failed, and move aside and we'll get somebody who does. So there is that drive for profit, which is overwhelming. And overwhelming in the sense that it simply overwhelms the industry. Technologically, we've gone from a time when people thought about what it is they were going to put on the air to a time today when everything is live. And when everything is live, there's no time to think. You hope that you've got the information and you can deliver it well, but there's no guarantee. Um, I'll tell you a quick story about, about Murrow. Um, Murrow was one of the first reporters into the Nazi death camp at Buchenwald. And what he saw there simply overwhelmed him. What is it that Murrow did? Did he leave the death camp and find a CBS microphone and tell the American people what he had saw? No. He went back to his hotel room where he spent two days trying to find the words that could explain the horror of Buchenwald. Then he did the broadcast. That would be totally unacceptable today. Totally. So that is the, the two worlds that exist. Your question is valid. Journalism plays a huge role in this. Its link to the formation of public policy is obvious. Happens every day in every way. Could the Iraqi authorization resolution be considered the equivalent of a declaration of war? No. No, and I, I'll tell you why. Um, a declaration of war, I mean, think about the last time there was a declaration of war. The president went to Congress. There was the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor the day before. The president goes and he said, this is unacceptable. We are at war. It was a friend of mine used the word stark. It was a stark statement of a national commitment to fight the Japanese and defeat them. And I think when you talk about these congressional resolutions, they are gentle statements. There's nothing stark about them. There's nothing national about them. There's nothing that says, nation, wake up. We're in the middle of something that could tear us to pieces, where we could lose. There's nothing like that. Uh, even the resolution authorizing the US in 1991 in January, even that resolution could have been ignored by the president. Most Americans paid no attention to it because they were not asked to do anything. In World War II, the whole country was asked to do something. And that is the difference between a declaration of war and all of these very flaky congressional resolutions which sort of get the congressmen and the senators off the hook. Mm -hmm. If they're if their people, when it comes to an election, say, well, where were you on the Iraq war? Well, I voted for it. I voted for it. Really. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Thank, Thank you. you all very, very much. Appreciate it.